Hello all, my name is Ryan Lasley. I am a physical therapist and currently completing my manual fellowship with the IAOM. I am up here in Anchorage, Alaska with Valerie Phelps and her colleagues uh, completing my last clinical rotation. And during our rotation, we got into an interesting discussion about Serva. So this presentation is based on Serva, which is also short for shoulder injury related to vaccine administration. Now, it is very important that we discuss prior to the, uh, to the presentation that in no way does the IAOM US or any of its employees and or associates advocate or recommend against vaccinations. This information is offered as a tutorial for a vaccine related condition. And if there are any concerns regarding this topic, we recommend you discuss them with your family physician or a physician. Now, ultimately, Serva, we need to define this condition and it is best defined by the National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. And it basically uh, is defined as shoulder pain with limited range of motion within 48 hours after vaccine receipt in individuals with no prior history of pain, inflammation, or dysfunction of the affected shoulder before vaccine administration. You must be asking yourself why does the VICP even exist in the first place? Well, the National Childhood Vaccine Protection Act was created in 1988 to combat uh, litigation brought on by the pertussis vaccine. Basically, companies that produced vaccines were going bankrupt, basically completing any type of litigation and then payout that was resultant of injury or other outcomes from the vaccine. So therefore, the government stepped in and needed to stop uh, 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 necessary vaccine producers from going um, out of business. Now, with this um, uh, organization, they created the Vaccine Adverse Event Reporting System as well, which is obviously necessary for such events and easily is found on the hhs.gov website. The uh, etiology of um, CERVA basically is um, a vaccine antigen antibody reaction or any of its adjuvants contained in the vaccine. So therefore, it's usually seen anytime there's a vaccine administered and common vaccines are going to be the influenza vaccine, tetanus, and many others. And most recently, the COVID-19 vaccine, which obviously has possibly put you in a position where you might have seen this in your clinic. Now, all the way back in 1962, Dumond uh, reported of vaccines causing shoulder trauma and harm by um, having the vaccine directly injected into the joint with an inflammatory based response due to the antigen antibody complex reactions. And then it basically resulted in pain and dysfunction. Um, the population that is actually affected with this is mostly women, much more so than men, as you can see here, 85% of, of such cases in a study recently that went all the way up to 2017. And you notice that age was not a dependent factor during this, uh, which should be noted that children have the vaccine in other parts other than their arm. And that's part of the reason why children aren't, vac are, aren't included in this. Um, also, the studies didn't really lead into uh, race, ethnicity, and other defining characteristics. Now, you can see from this, which I pulled from another governmental website, that it is quite common to have vaccine-related injury due to the impl uh, implementation of a vaccine into the human body. But you'll see at the very bottom, the influenza vaccine. It has been applied in almost 1.5 billion people up to 2017. And ultimately, as you can see, 2,833 cases were recorded but out of that, only 1.9 cases per million vaccines. So therefore, vaccines are extremely safe and beneficial for society. Signs and symptoms of CERVA. The most commonly reported statement from patients with this condition is that the vaccine was administered too high in the arm, and it was reported in nearly 82% of the cases. The normal signs and symptoms of uh, serva are shoulder pain with numerous uh, symptoms such as sharpness, dull, a tight tension, and also the pain can be in constant in nature. Uh, there's neurologic symptoms on occasion associated with it, which include numbness, tingling, uh, neck pain, sh scapular pain, thoracic pain can also be a component to this due to the nature of the scapulothoracic, scapulohumoral uh, uh, region. 
Um, there will be a resulting active range of motion limit, both capsular and non-capsular, and very dependent on the application of the vaccine. There will be swelling in the shoulder, mostly at the site of the uh, vaccination site, as well as redness. The redness can last for weeks, as one of my patients with rheumatic disorders actually uh, displayed for me not too long ago. Now, considerations with CERVA. We need to take into account existing shoulder pathologies that might have predated the actual vaccine. That could include bony and cartilaginous, labral, capsuloligamentous, rotary cuff and supportive muscle dysfunctions at the scapula, bursa, and acromioclavicular joint. And this should take into account subclinical conditions that have met, might have been present prior to vaccine or even are recurrent but have not been so in quite some time. Now, with CERVA, after some time has passed, physicians might go and get imaging studies, and ultimately, like all imaging studies, they're going to find some type of positive finding, and lots of times they're going to find fluid deep in the deltoid or around or over the cuff tendons. They're going to find bursitis, and they might even find subchondral bone deterioration or cuff uh, tear which is usually a response to the subclinical or other conditions that might have been present previously. Now, treatment with CERVA, at the beginning, they're going to possibly recommend non-narcotic analgesics over the counters. After or if they don't uh, p produce positive uh, results, you might be able to get prescription uh, uh, skin uh, topical ointments or an and analgesics along with the possibility that a physician might inject uh, corticosteroid into the subacromial space, intraarticularly uh, in the general region, um, along with a referral for physical therapy and always last surgical procedures if it goes unresolved. Now, vaccine application is of importance with CERVA and it's been recommended that the selection of the injection site should be midway between the acromion and the deltoid tuberosity with the arm abducted to 60 degrees. Um, another way of taking this is, is that it should be at least two to three fingers width below the acromion as this photo indicates. As the acromion is here, deltoid tuberosity is here, there's somewhere in between, which is a very good intramuscular deltoid vaccine uh, site. So in the event that a patient is thin, has a low body fat content, those patients might need to have other types of techniques performed with the vaccine administration, including pinching the deltoid and lifting it off of the humerus. So that way we uh, limit the structures for which the needle might impact with the vac uh, vaccine injection. And then lastly, it's up to the physician or the provider, but you could change the needle length as well to a shorter, smaller needle, uh, limiting the depth of penetration as well. Now, that concludes uh, my discussion on CERVA, and my references are uh, uh, present in this last slide for you to look into, uh, read for yourself, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully take into your clinic for positive use in the future. As Ryan described in his short lecture on CERVA, there are numerous types of pathologies that can be created with an injection. Two that we're going to see commonly in the clinic is going to be a synovitis due to the needle uh, dropping some of the solution into the glenohumeral joint, or we can see what we call an acute subacromial bursitis. One is going to show what we call a capsular pattern of limited motions, and the other is a very bold non-capsular pattern. We're going to use three simple motions to test in clinical testing. On the normal side or the unaffected side, we'll start with external rotation. Normally, that's going to be somewhere between 60 and 90 degrees as a norm. Then we have glenohumeral abduction, Normally, that's going to be about 90 degrees. And the third motion is going to be arm behind the back where the hand fits in the small of the back. Those are the three motions that are going to give us the most information. In a capsular pattern, what we see is the affected side is going to have a significant loss of external rotation. 
often about 30 degrees. So if it's 60 degrees is the norm side, the affected side is going to show us 30 degrees. Glenohumeral abduction is going to have a significant loss, but less than external rotation. So if it's 90 on the left side, the affected side here being the right side will give us a 20 degree loss or glenohumerally abduct to 70 degrees. Lastly, the internal rotation will show a limit of about 10 degrees, meaning that the hand reaches just about the buttock level, but does not fully reach the low back. So a capsular pattern for the shoulder is measured in external rotation, glenohumeral abduction and internal rotation, and the limitations are in a ratio of three to two to one. That would show us a classic synovitis. Now the unique thing about an acute subacromial bursitis is that the individual is generally in severe pain. So while they will have normal external rotation, abduction, and internal rotation on the non-affected side, the affected side, interestingly enough, will also show normal external rotation, normal internal rotation, but glenohumeral abduction will be severely limited and severely painful. And this is due to the sudden volume of fluid in the subacromial space. And we call this a non-capsular pattern.